We'll open your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, 1. It's found on page 536, if you're going to use one of the few Bibles that we have. This week, uh, we're celebrating Christmas, right? Christmas is the birth of Christ. That's the celebration we remember back, His coming. And one of the common things with the Christmas season is Christmas music. We like to sing Christmas songs. In fact, we like Christmas songs so much, there's an entire genre of Christmas music that we package into this last month or so of the year. Each, each year that comes, you always pack it into that last month, maybe two months along, and in fact, there's a lot of debates that, uh, about uh, Christmas music. When is it okay to begin playing Christmas music? Can you do that in July? And generally, the answer is no. You have to reserve it for that one specific season. Uh, there always seems to be a debate as to when you can start it. Um, and uh, everybody has a different view on when that date should be. We have this debate that goes on in our family as well, in our household. When is it okay to begin playing Christmas music? Some will say after the first snowfall. But then, of course, there's always the debate. What is the first snowfall? Does that mean that there was a flake that fell out of the sky, or does that mean that we have snow on the ground and the ground is now white? What constitutes a snowfall to begin playing Christmas music? Others in the home will say it's the first snowfall or it's November 1st, just in case we have a warm October and there is no snow, at least November 1st we can begin playing Christmas music. Um, I, of course, am the head of our house, and therefore I know the rules best because I get to make the rule. The official rule in our house is Christmas music begins the first snowfall, when it actually lands on the ground, after November 1st. That's the official rule. Then you can begin to listen to Christmas music. It's not because I don't like Christmas music. It's because I really like Thanksgiving as well, and I want to enjoy Thanksgiving and then come to the Christmas season and celebrate Christmas with the music of Christmas. One of the things that's not debated is the love of Christmas music. In fact, Christians have been singing of the birth of Christ for generations. The earliest songs about the, Christ, the birth of Christ can date all the way back to the 4th century. Most of the older songs, Christmas songs, we no longer sing for a variety of reasons, mostly because many of them were not in English. We don't know other languages to be singing them well enough, so we are limited in our repertoire here in this nation, but many of the older songs have been forgotten. However, there are some of our favorite songs that are probably older than we realize. One such Christmas carol is God rest ye merry gentlemen. It's an old Christmas song. It's, uh, it's, nowhere near one of the, it's nowhere near the oldest of the Christmas carols, but it is generally regarded as the Christmas carol. In fact, when Dickens wrote his famous book, The Christmas Carol, it was this song, God rest ye merry gentlemen, that is listed in the book. This song is the carol to which he named the book for. Who wrote the song? Nobody knows. As I said, we speculate that it dates back to the 16th century, but the first and oldest known printing of the song comes from 1760. It's still a popular song. It's, it's sung every year. It's, it's recorded by countless artists. In fact, you can find it in just about any style that you would like. Bing Crosby and Nat King Cole to Tennessee Ernie Ford, Perry Cuomo. Julie Andrews has one. Smokey Robinson, Randy Travis, Kenny Rogers, and Garth Brooks, if you prefer country. Neil Diamond, Mariah Carey, Mercy Me, 38 Special, Lonely Hearts, and more recently, Pentatonics. All of them have a recording or a rendition of God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. What hasn't changed over the years, though, are the lyrics. There have been some slight variations since 1760. But for the most part, the lyrics to the song have remained the same. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O tidings of comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. These have been the basic lyrics throughout the generation but one thing that has changed is the understanding of the words that are used. 
You know, the interesting thing when we sing a lot of these older songs is that the words are different. They're, we have many of the same words, but they have different meanings than when they were originally written, what they are meaning today. And that sometimes changes how we sing them. Sometimes we sing songs, and I'm not sure we even understand what it is that we're singing. We look at the words. I think it's the case with this song. The English language has changed since the words were written. Some of their meanings have changed. Some of their usages have changed. The words rest and marry in this song have changed meanings in the last three to 400 years. The words dismay and tidings are words that we don't frequently use today. There's an even more difficult issue in understanding the lyrics to that Christmas carol. It comes with a punctuation. There's a comma in the first line and it's been moved. It's been moved because of a differing understanding and definition of the word Mary. If we're to read the song the way it's written today, what we're inclined to believe is that we're singing a song about happy fellows who are being urged to take a nap. God rest you, happy, merry, gentlemen. Take a rest. And we, if we're not careful, we'll sing this song with the idea that the comfort and joy that's being sung about it at the end that is brought through Jesus Christ is a cozy vacation with our family and friends. It's a table full of food. It's a tree that's packed with presents. This is the comfort and joy that Jesus came and died to purchase for us. It's not the intent of the song, certainly not the reason that Jesus came. What happens, though, with this season is that we, we get caught up in the emotions of it, in the visions of sugar plums dance in our heads. Those visions that dance in our head during the Christmas season are nothing more than emotions that melt away like the dream that they are when January dawns. Reality begins to settle in when January comes. Dismay and discouragement that was on us the rest of the the year prior will come back again in January. They don't just disappear because we've had some warm feelings this week. In fact, often the discouragement that comes in January is heavier, more burdensome, especially when bills come in from the holidays that we overspent. Now we have to pay. 2020 has been a difficult year for most people. I don't know anybody actually that has said, 2020 has been the best year of my life. It's just been great. It's been so easy and wonderful. But I have met countless people who have said, man, this has been a tough year. And I've met several people that have said, this has been the hardest year of my life. 2020 has been a difficult year. It's been a hard year for me. I'm not uh, prepared to say it's been the most difficult year of my life. I've had some other years that have been pretty difficult too. But it has certainly been one of the most difficult years. I can't think of another year where I have experienced so much loss, so much loss of life as this year. The strain of ministry during a global pandemic has at times been overwhelming. It's been a battle for me emotionally. It turned into a battle physically. And I will likely bear the scars of the stress of this year for the rest of my life. Parts of my face are not re- returning At least they're taking their sweet time. (laughs) So my eye continues to bother me. My mouth continues to give me struggles. Some of those may never come back. They'll be the scars of 2020. It's been a difficult year. And I think as we come to the end of it, everybody's excited. Good riddance to 2020. On to 2021. It's going to be much better. Is it going to be much better? Is there a reason to believe that 2021, when we turn the calendar page, suddenly that the year is going to be issue, without problem or struggle. There really isn't any indication that things are going to change in January. If anything, they may actually get more difficult. 2021 may, in reality, be more, a more difficult year than 2020. And yet, we're singing at Christmas songs that talk about comfort and joy. What is it about Christmas that should cause us to sing tidings of comfort and joy? My mind has been resting on these, thing, these thoughts for quite some time. This, this Christmas carol has been ringing in my mind for quite some time. Comfort and joy. Tidings of comfort and joy. 
What's so special about Christmas that we sing tidings of comfort and joy? I wanted to know. So I turned to a passage of Scripture that speaks of comfort and joy, a passage of Scripture that promises comfort and joy to come. And that's where we find ourselves in Isaiah chapter 9. So I'm going to invite you to stand with me as I read the Scriptures this morning. Isaiah 9, and we'll read verses 1 through 7. But there will be no, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into, con- into contempt the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you with joy at the harvest, as they they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, and over his kingdom, to establish it and and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Zeal of the Lord of the hosts will do this. Father, I pray that you would uh, quiet our thoughts, our distractions. We come this morning, allow us to focus on your word and to behold wonderful things from your law. We see the glory of Christ who was born in Bethlehem. We see the comfort and joy that comes through him alone this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Prophet Isaiah, in writing this passage, well, in writing his, uh, in his book, he's writing to the people of God with a specific purpose to warn them. The people of God had fallen into the sin of idolatry. They were worshiping the false gods of their surrounding nations. They were lacking to trust in the Almighty God. And so as a result, judgment was coming. Condemnation was looming over them. And the prophet Isaiah had the job of telling the children of Israel Condemnation is coming. Judgment is coming. He lived during the time of the divided kingdom. If you recall, after King Solomon died, the kingdom divided. The northern kingdom bore the name Israel and had wicked kings always, and always did wicked. The southern kingdom bore the name Judah and had some good kings and some wicked kings. As Isaiah is beginning to write, in, in his prophecy here, the northern kingdom and its wicked kings are the first to be taken into captivity. They were all but blotted from the earth. It wouldn't be long before the southern kingdom, Judah, would also be taken into captivity. They were insistent, instead of repenting, they were insistent on following their sister Israel and worshiping the false gods and in neglecting the God of their fathers. Much of the first 35 chapters of the book of Isaiah are warnings. It's speaking of the judgment and the condemnation to come. You have sinned. You have rejected the living God. You have worshipped the false gods. And as a result, there is judgment coming. You're going to be swept away into captivity. It isn't until chapter 40, until the end, that we find comfort. In fact, The last ending of the book, Isaiah is prophesying of hope and comfort. The hope and comfort of the Lord for the people who have been taken captive. And the promise is that there will be a Messiah who's going to come. A Messiah who's going to deliver you. In fact, those latter chapters are a beautiful chapter to rest your mind on, to meditate and consider the salvation of the Lord. The first 35 chapters, as I mentioned, are generally judgment and condemnation, but in the midst of that, there are windows of hope and there are songs of comfort that come through. One such window 
comes in the opening verses here of chapter 9, our text this morning. It's a familiar Christmas text. It tells of the coming Savior. It talks about a, a child being born, a son that is given, and we know that this is pointing toward forward to Jesus. We have the New Testament. We have the Revelation. We have the birth of Christ recorded in Luke chapter 2, and we know that He is the fulfillment of this passage. So for us, we get to look forward and backwards as we work through the text. And we get to enjoy the comfort and joy of chapter 9. But I think for us to really understand what the prophet is, is telling us in chapter 9, we also need to understand a little bit of what was going on in chapter 8. Before we can enjoy the comfort and joy of 9, we need to consider the gloom and darkness of chapter 8. The call of God for Isaiah was to fear God, not to be caught up in the conspiracies of the people. If you go back and read chapter 8, you'll find it talking about that. God is saying, Isaiah, don't, you need to fear me. Don't get caught up in the conspiracies of the people. I think we could learn a lesson from that today. That's another sermon. Not to get caught up in the conspiracies of the day, but to fear the living God. This was the call to Isaiah. And as he is writing, he is, he is bringing the judgment of God. And the judgment of God was falling on the people because they were seeking false gods. They were neglecting to cry out to the living God. They had abandoned the God of deliverance, the God of their fathers. As a result, God says in Isaiah 8.22, They will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Here's the condemnation. You've rejected God and you've turned towards false gods, and here's what's coming. Darkness and gloom. That's what's going to come. Darkness and gloom. Darkness and gloom represent the absence of comfort and joy. From merely a, a temporal perspective, one might look back at 2020 and say that it was a year of darkness and gloom. It was a hard and a difficult year. Chapter 9 begins with a, uh, a small little word, the word but. This little conjunction is contrasting the gloom and darkness and it is offering us an alternative. It's promising that there is an alternative. Yes, there's gloom and there is darkness, but, but, there is hope. There is comfort. There is joy. There will be no more gloom. That's how the, the, the chapter begins. That first verse is a lengthy verse, but it tells us that there is no gloom. It says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. You who were in anguish, it's an anguish to be in gloom and darkness. For her who was in anguish, there will be no gloom. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali were regions of the northern tribes of Israel. If you look in, the, in your Bible, you'll probably find maps. And if you find a map with the, with the tribes of Israel, you'll find that Zebulon and, and, and Naphtali were in the northern part of the country. They were the first areas to be taken, captiv taken into captivity by the Assyrians. They were the first to experience the gloom and the darkness. They were the first to experience the judgment and condemnation. As the verse is beginning, it's telling us that there were gloom and darkness on them. In the former times, there was, they were brought into contempt. Condemnation fell on them. Later on, this same region would be called Galilee. and In it was a city called Nazareth. From Nazareth came Mary and Joseph. Though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he was born in Bethlehem as a fulfillment of prophecy. He was born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth, in the region of Galilee. In other words, what the verse is telling us is this, this region of land that was a region of contempt is now becoming a region of hope. What once brought gloom and darkness is soon going to bring comfort and joy. Following this introduction to the song, the song then begins. Much of the book of Isaiah is written in a poetic form. It's poetic prophecy. And so it's written similar to what the Psalms would be written. It's poems, it's songs that are being written here. The first segment of this song has two declarations, and that's followed by three reasons for the declarations. 
to support the declarations, and then ultimately this passage ends with one cause, one source for all of this to come true. I want to look at it together with you. The two declarations, the first one is found in verse 2, and it's the fact that it is the comfort of light. The comfort of light. Verse 2, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. To walk in darkness or to live in darkness is a strain. It's a difficulty. It's a hardship. Nothing is easy in darkness. Everything is more difficult. If you try to do a project at night, it's hard to do at night. When dawn comes, it's much easier to see. You can do things much easier. If you tried to clear this snow from the snowstorm in the, in the dark hours of the early morning like I did, it's difficult. You run the risk of damaging things because you can't see. When you wait until the sun comes, everything seems easier. It's not as difficult. There was no comfort for the people who had abandoned the living God, who had left the Creator. There was no comfort for them. They were living in darkness, spiritual darkness. They had no hope. Years ago, I, uh, I worked for the prison system up in New Hampshire, and when I was there, I was working the night shift. The long hours from 11 o'clock at night until 7 in the morning are dark. But the darkest, longest hour is the 3 o'clock hour. And it was always hard to get through that 3 o'clock hour. But I remember the, the comfort that would come when the sun would begin to shine. You'd look out through the windows or through the door into the prison yard and it would begin to, to get lighter and brighter. The sky would begin to illuminate as the sun crested the horizon. And what that brought was hope. Partly it was hope because I knew we were getting closer to 7 o'clock when I was getting to go home. But a lot of it was just hope because the darkness was done. The day was coming. It, it was getting bright. The light of day brings hope. Long hours of living in darkness have a depressing effect. They bring gloom. In fact, they are detrimental to your health. That's why there are so many health issues so much depression that is there around those who live in cultures and in communities where they have seasons, entire seasons of night and seasons of darkness. It's estimated that if you work a full career at, of the night shift, 11 o'clock till 7 in the morning, that you will lose 10 years of your life. It's harder in the dark. Everything is harder in the dark. The opening declaration of this song is that there is... Or, that there is light to come. You, you have rejected God, and the condemnation and the consequences of that is gloom and darkness. You're going to be swept away and taken into captivity. But there, is, there is light to come. There is comfort that comes. There is hope that comes. There is a great light coming. And you know what? Some 800 years after this is written, there were shepherds out in a field in the darkness of night with their sheep, and they would be greeted by an angel and a great light. Luke 2, 9 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Where do I get the great light? It's the glory of the Lord that shone around them. They weren't sitting there on a darkened field, and suddenly there's an angel, and then there was just a little bit of glow. The glory of the Lord shone around them. The whole place must have been filled with His glory. The imagery from Isaiah 6, when Isaiah sees the glory and the holiness of God, is that it, it is the whole place is filled with the glory of the Lord. Filled with the glory of His train. I would imagine as the shepherds were there, and the area is filled with the glory of the Lord, that it was shining bright. A great light. Shining glory of God comes. And it is joyous news. What is the news that comes with the glory of God? It is that the Savior has come. You know, when you're stuck in darkness, there is nothing more comforting than to find out the Savior has come. There's comfort when you hear, there's a Savior coming. We're stuck in here. We can't get out. It's complete darkness. There didn't seem to be any hope, but we just got word there's, there's someone coming with a light to help. But the great comfort is when the light finally arrives. 
when the Savior finally comes, because the long night is over and the comfort of light has come. The second declaration of this song is the joy of the harvest, and you find it in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you with the joy of the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. The harvest of the Savior brings joy. A joy that is described as the joy of the harvest. So, the Savior comes and His arrival brings this joy like the joy of the harvest season. Now, for most of us, that's kind of lost on us. We don't really understand what the harvest means. We can hardly understand it. Some who have farming in their background will understand a little bit better. The harvest joy is a special kind of joy. It's the joy of endurance and the joy of perseverance. The hard work of tilling the ground and cultivating the seed, protecting the crop as it begins to come through the ground, weathering the storms as the wind blows and the rain comes and the hail falls, warding off blight and other funguses and protecting it from insects that might come and destroy the crop, weeding out the tares and the thorns and the thistles so that the the fruit is produced and the plant grows. And finally... Harvest season comes, and the fruit is ripe. And you go out and you pluck the fruit and you bring it in. There is a great joy, a joy of the harvest. The crop has survived and there will be food. We have endured, we have made it through, and all the struggle, all the blood, all the sweat, all the tears is worth it. We have the harvest. What a great joy. This is why the pilgrims celebrated Thanksgiving had a harvest feast to say thanks to God because He had provided. They made it through. They survived. They were going to have food. It is a joyous season of celebration. Well, the arrival of the Savior brings joy. This harvest kind of joy. Because we've endured the hardship. We've come to the end. And we have not fallen away. Put it in terms of the gospel illustration, the gospel parable of Jesus. The seed has not been stolen away by the villain, has not been trampled down on the hardened ground. Our roots have not given out during the season of drought. They've not been scorched by the searing sun. They have stretched deep into the rich soil of godly hope. We have not been overcome by the thorns. We have not been choked by the cares of this world. There is a great joy in God's faithfulness to preserve us and enable us to persevere to the end. Hope for people was that they would endure the captivity and be brought back. That was the temporal hope to the people that Jesus or that uh, Isaiah is writing to. That they'll endure, they're going to make it through. Yes, there's captivity coming. Yes, there's judgment. It's going to be a season of gloom and darkness, but there is hope. There is hope that you'll be brought back you'll be saved, that a light will come, that comfort will come, that joy will come. There is a hope. But it wasn't just about the temporal deliverance from Assyria and later on Babylon. Far greater than this deliverance from physical captivity is the deliverance from sin. Captivity to sin. Because of sin, we are held captive by the master of sin, the father of lies, the devil himself. Deliverance, the arrival of Jesus, brings us hope. His work would be completed with His crucifixion. The prophetic song makes these two declarations, but then it gives us three reasons to know that they will take place. We find the three reasons signaled in the song by the word for. Remember your rules of grammar when you're reading. Take note of words and what they mean. We see the two declarations and then we come to verses 4, 5, and 6 and we see the word for. That is signifying to us that there's a reason here. The first reason is the broken burden or that the burden is broken. It's found in verse 4. It says, for, F-O-R, for, the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken. It's on the day of Midian. The garden sin of Adam put all of humanity under the burden of sin, the yoke of our oppressor. Sin became the oppressor of man. We shifted under 
leadership of the father of lies, the devil himself. And there is a weight and a yoke that we cannot bear. The hope and the promise is that the Savior will come and He will wear the yoke for us. He will bear the burden that is ours and He will deliver us. He will save us. God Himself will be the one who delivers us. The song here in Isaiah gives us a clue as to how this deliverance will occur. The power of the oppressor will be broken, it says, as on the day of Midian. As on the day of Midian. This is a reference back to Judges 7 in the battle between Gideon and Midian. Do you remember Gideon? Gideon was a reluctant leader. Midian, the Midianites were this enormous army that was coming in and they were going to utterly destroy them. God raises up Gideon and an army. The army that God raises up is a paltry army of only 300 men. and Their leader was a reluctant warrior. But the battle was won. It was won in a miraculous way, in a way that only God could do. A way that would allow us only to give God glory for the victory. To know that it was God who provided deliverance. So rather than fighting in hand-to-hand combat, the men of Gideon stood around the camp of the Midianites at night, and they broke open their lanterns. And when they broke open the lanterns and they shined around them, they also blew their horns. Judges 7.22 says, When they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. The army fled. Here's what happened. As they stood around, they broke open their jars. The lantern shone. And then they blew 300 trumpets. And at the sound of it, the Midianites got up and pulled their swords. And in panic and fear, they began to fight each other to the point that they all ended up fleeing and running away, thinking they were being conquered It was a miraculous deliverance. Only done by God, not by the effort of man. Here's the picture. It's not going to be by the effort of man that the burden of sin will be broken. It is only going to be by the miraculous work of God. And it's going to be done in a way that only God can receive the glory, a way that is different than any of us would conceive. If you and I are drawing up battle plans to go up against a great army, this is not the plan that we would choose the way God laid it out in Midian. And Isaiah is saying, there is going to come a deliverance from the burden of sin, and it's going to be done in a miraculous way, kind of like the way Midian was miraculous. And when we look forward to the way that we're delivered from the burden of sin, what do we find? But we we find a baby born of a virgin. Miraculous thing. We wouldn't design this. We wouldn't send a child, a baby, as the deliverer. We wouldn't choose the cross and the crucifixion as the means of victory. It wouldn't be our plan, but this is the divine plan of God, the miraculous plan of God, so that only God can receive the glory and only God can break the burden. It is the miraculous hand of God in the most impossible way. The second reason that comfort and joy will come is found in verse 5. It's the end of death. Verse 5 says, For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned for fuel, burned as fuel for the fire. The sin of man brought the plague of death. It is appointed for man to die once. But the dangerous death is not that once It's the second death. It's the death that comes after death when the eternal weight of the holy wrath of God and torment is placed on man in hell. This is the real dangerous death. It's the second death. Here there is an offering of deliverance from it. Symbols of war are the boots that trample and the bloody garments of of the dead warriors. The song of comfort and joy tells us that they will be burned. The symbol and the illustration is that the end of death is coming. Death will be defeated and there will be no more. It will be swallowed up in victory. There is an end to the second death. There is a way of hope, a way of escape. There is life, eternal life that is offered. 
the comfort of dwelling in the presence of God. That's what eternal life is. The joy of seeing the Savior's face. The third reason is the most familiar. It's from the most familiar parts of the passage at least. They're found in verses 6 and 7. And that is that a son is given. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The final reason here is the most powerful reason. It's weighted by this glorious description of the child to come. The son to be born. He will be a ruler like no other. He will be both man and God. And he bears this descriptive name of Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are names that are worthy of us spending time and meditating on, thinking about. Often when we come to this passage, that's where we focus. But I want us to consider the first part of verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The hope that is offered here is not vague or abstract. The comfort and the joy that is being presented is not vague or abstract. It's it's not general or generic. It's very specific and it's very personal. To us. Us. Child is born. To us. Son is given. This is the intimate love of the father to his lost children. The good shepherd coming to find his lost sheep. To save us, us who are under Satan's power because we have long gone astray. In fact, the language of the son here, that a son is given, that takes us all the way back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden again. It takes us back to the first sin by our parents. Remember, Adam and Eve are in the garden and they sin, they do what they are told not to do and eat from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. They try to hide themselves from God and God comes walking through in the cool of the evening and has this conversation with them and they confess that they have eaten. And the Lord delivers a judgment against man and woman and the serpent. And the serpent in the story is Satan himself. To the woman... Judgment says that she'll have pain in childbirth and a desire for her husband's place. To the man, he is to work hard by the sweat of his brow. He will now battle thorns and thistles and weeds as he works to raise a harvest. For the serpent, God said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. In the midst of the damning judgment on them, there is hope that is delivered. One day, there's going to be a son who is born. A son who will restore the comfort and joy of the garden. He'll do so by defeating the enemy, crushing the head of the serpent. Eve understood what it was that Jesus or what it was that God was saying here in the garden. This is why she was so happy when she bore her first son. Any time that a mother has a child, there's, there's happiness, there's joy, there's excitement of a, of, a new, of a new child, of a new baby that she holds in her arms. But the excitement and joy that Eve had when her first son was born is far more than just the, the excitement of a child being born. It's the hope of a Savior. She responded to the birth of her first son, Cain, in Genesis 4.1 by saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. The hope here was for the son to be given. Remember, that was the promise. Her offspring would crush the head of the serpent. So when Eve brings forth and has Cain, there is excitement. Is this the son? Is this the offspring that you have promised that would come and crush the head of the serpent that would deliver us, that would bring us back, that would restore things? That was her hope. That was her excitement would not be pain. 
would not be that son. In fact, it would be many generations and thousands of years before the appointed time would come. But Isaiah prophesied, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The son would be given, the child would be born. This would be the son who would take away the sin of the world, the son who would crush the head of the serpent, and the son, the child, is given to us. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He is the one who will restore all things. He is the one who will bring comfort and joy. The declarations, comfort and light, or the comfort of light and the joy of the harvest are coming. The three reasons to celebrate, because the burden is broken. There is the end of death and the sun is given. But behind all of this, there is only one cause. That comes in the very last phrase of verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The cause behind all of this is the Lord. The Lord of hosts. This is the Lord by name. The self-existent eternal God. The God of a host of armies. And it is the zeal of the Lord of the hosts that will do this. Zeal is a passionate ardor. It's an eager desire to obtain something. The eager desire of the Lord is to make this happen. Give His Son Buy back his creation from sin. The eternal, self existent God who is all powerful will do this, Isaiah tells us. As we come to a close this morning, I want to return us to our little Christmas carol. It kind of left us dangling at the beginning. I want to come back and, and finish a little bit about that. Remember, I said that there were some words that had changed meanings. There were some that are not commonly used today, and there's that important punctuation error. The word rest in the song, God rest ye merry gentlemen. Rest does not have the same meaning today as it did when it was written. The meaning behind the word rest here is that of keeping. And the implication that it is God who is doing the keeping. So when it says, God rest ye merry gentlemen, it's saying, God keep you Mary, gentlemen. God is the one that will hold you. God is the one that will sustain you. God is the one that will keep you. His intent here, in the, according to the song, is not to keep us happy, but rather to keep us strong or mighty. Because the word merry doesn't mean merriment. It doesn't mean happy. What it means is strong and mighty. That's the old English meaning for merry. Consider Robin Hood. Remember Robin Hood, the legend of Robin Hood and his band of merry men? They weren't a band of happy men. They were a band of strong and mighty men. This Christmas carol is using the same kind of language. God rest ye merry gentlemen is this idea of being strong and mighty. Dismay is an uncommon word today, but it means to lose courage or to become depressed, a, a sinking heart. To lose heart, we might say. Tidings is another old-fashioned word. It means recent news. Therefore, good tidings would be good news. Good recent news. But the greater issue here in this song is the, the missed punctuation. The comma that has been moved. And it's probably been moved because there was a misunderstanding of the word merry. When we assume merry means happy and merriment, it would make sense that Mary is there to modify gentlemen. And so they place the comma between ye and Mary. God rest ye, Mary gentlemen. But when we understand that Mary is mighty, we also understand that the comma was supposed to be between Mary and gentlemen. Mary is not intended to modify gentlemen. It really is God rest ye, Mary gentlemen. God rest ye, Mary gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. If I were to write this in a more modern understanding, in a sentence form, it would read something like this, God will keep you gentlemen safe and strong so that nothing will cause you to lose heart. Because Jesus Christ was born this day to save those of us who have gone astray. This brings news of comfort and joy. That doesn't flow very well in a song. So if I were to 
write it in a way that might keep a little bit better with the tune. It would go something like this. God keep you mighty, gentlemen. Let nothing, dis- nothing to discourage. Jesus Christ our Savior was born upon this day to save His people from Satan's power when we had gone astray. This brings good news of comfort and joy. God keep you mighty, gentlemen. God will do the keeping. God will keep you strong. He will hold you in so that nothing will bring discouragement to you. Why? Because Jesus Christ is born on this day. He was born on this day to save His people from Satan's power. The people who have gone astray. That is the good news of comfort and joy. That's the good news behind the song. More than that, that's the good news behind the Scriptures. It's the good news behind Christmas. It's the good news behind the coming of Jesus. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Comfort and joy that carries us through the end of this difficult year and into another one. The Son, the Savior, the one who has come. Pray together. Father, we thank you for Christ and the coming of our Savior. We thank you for the joy, the hope, the peace that comes in Him alone. Pray, Father, that you would uh, stir in our hearts an understanding of who Jesus is. And I pray, Lord, for those hearing the hope of Christ, perhaps for the first time, that your Spirit would do the miraculous work of salvation that only you can do, the work at Midian miraculous work of the birth of Christ, miraculous work of being born again. You cause them to have eyes to see and ears to hear and place their hope in Christ and find comfort and joy that comes through Him alone. Pray and ask in Jesus' name.